Hey guys, I'm Alex Flum here for TLB TV. Really, there's nothing like coming back to school after a nice long summer. You get to see all your friends again. You get a new batch of classes that you got to start. But it also means that fall sports here in College Park are back in action. The big change this year, a new head football coach, DJ Durkin. He's an aggressive recruiter, a strong defensive mind, and he's looking to take the football program to new heights. We have a, a talented enough team to go, go play and play well this year. Um, what equals that? I don't know. I, I think fans and media equate more of those things to, to wins and losses. I, I think for us, obviously, we know the game is winning and we're, we're trying to win every game we play. After a training camp battle, quarterback Perry Hills will be starting under center for the Terrapins. Cornerback Will likely is back again this year foregoing the NFL draft. He'll be playing on offense, defense, and special teams. We have like team meetings where players talk to us and he, he got up to us and talked to us and told us what it meant for him to come back and to play one more year with us and it's another opportunity for him to get better as a football player. So with the highly anticipated first Maryland football game of the season coming up against Howard on Saturday, we're thrilled to be joined here by Jeff Ashiru, former Maryland Terps linebacker and Kyle Stackpole, sports editor of the Diamondback. Now, Jeff, you spent one year with the Terps after transferring from UConn. You played under Randy Edsel. Now you have DJ Durkin coming in. How is that going to change this program? What is he going to bring to the table? Like I've seen it happen before where they bring in a young new coach who all the players think are crazy, you know. So um, I think Durkin brings intensity. You know, he has the tutelage of Urban Meyer and Jim Harbaugh on his butt as well. So through that, I know that the team will just exponentially increase um, through the year. Yeah, going off that, the intensity, I know all the players, defensive end Roman Braglio said this, this camp was way harder than last year. I know Teldrick Morgan, who transferred from New Mexico State, said this was the hardest camp he's ever had and been a part of. And like you said, he's, got, he's, got, he's been at places that have had success. And you know now he's coaching all these position groups, but he'll definitely still have a big impact on the defensive end of the ball, too. And we talked about the Terps defense. You look at a player like Will Likely at defensive back, a guy that started off just in the secondary. You know, he started returning punts and kicks, and then the Terps playing him in some offensive sets last season. You know, how big is it for a team to have him back this year? You know, he opted to not enter the NFL draft during the offseason, and they'll have him back for his senior season. What is he going to contribute? Will Likely is an exceptional player. You know, he's a little guy, but he plays with the heart of a lion, you know. I think what separates his game from other people's game is his confidence in himself and his ability, and that's all. Yeah, he's huge. I know DJ Dirk, and he said his first thing when he became coach was trying to get Will Likely back to school, and now that that's happened, he's going to help in all three phases. And Coach Durkin's not afraid to have multiple players play both ways. You know, you look at Durkin, a defensive-minded guy. We bring up the defense a lot, but let's talk some offense. Perry Hills winning the quarterback competition. It seemed like at times there were four or five guys in that competition. Perry, the senior, coming out on top. You know, looking at his season coming up, how is he going to lead the offense? How is he going to do? From what I know about Perry, he's a very competitive guy, and he's a leader on, on the field and off the field as well. So I feel that he will be a field general out there. He will take control. I don't know if he's going to have 500 yards passing the game or anything like that, but he will definitely be a field, a field general out there and lead the team. Uh -huh. And Coach Durkin said that Perry Hills left no doubt in his mind that he was the number one quarterback. And he's, Walt Bell, the offensive coordinator, praised his toughness and his deep ball. He's going to be someone who's a dual threat quarterback. And basically with all the weapons that Maryland has returning, he just has to limit his mistakes. I know him and Caleb Rowe combined to throw the most interceptions in, of any FBS team last year. So I think if he can limit his mistakes, his passing ability and his, and his legs are definitely going to help the Maryland team. Let's talk predictions. Kyle, what you got happening with the Terps this season? Maryland, after a disappointing season last year, is going to get back to a bowl game. I think they have a whole new coaching staff. It looks like they have stability at the quarterback position, and their schedule seems pretty favorable, especially early on, to get to that six-win mark and get back to a bowl game. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Jeff, really appreciate it. Kyle, appreciate it as well. Make sure everyone to keep up with our football coverage this season. Our own reporter, Connor Mount, will be covering the football team throughout the entire season. Well, it was pretty quiet in College Park here this summer. Meanwhile, down in Brazil, well, there was plenty of stuff going on. You had the Summer Olympics. Maryland student athlete Misha Powell was down there competing for Canada. Our own Daniel Stein sat down with her today. We heard you had <laughs> quite an eventful summer this yeah, year. Yeah, just, you know, I just went to the Olympics. Oh, my gosh. So. Surreal. <laughs> All right, so. 
Mitchell, you went to the Olympics this summer, competed yes. in Rio. Yes, I did. So tell us a little bit about what it was like to prepare going yeah. into Rio. All right. So I went to uh, nationals first in Canada. Um, so I had to pr prepare myself to run against the best in the whole nation. And I actually came sixth. And it was a little bit disappointing because I was ranked second going in. And because of my long season, I felt like, oh, I kind of didn't show them what I had. Um, but I still got a second chance, and I was named to the 4x4 team. So I was uh, 21 and making my first Olympic team. It was That was the ultimate goal. So being able to check that off was just amazing. So I had to prepare myself for two more months of running, and that was uh, a little bit stressful, but it worked out in the end. Um, I was training alongside the best athletes in the world, and mm -hmm. getting to uh, just walk that in that closing ceremonies was incredible, and training up in the mountains, just, it was, I felt like a real professional athlete, and I feel like there's no turning back from there. I'm just going to keep looking forward and setting my goals even higher. Amazing. So <laughs> tell me about that feeling when you first walk out opening ceremonies, mm -hmm. representing Canada, yeah. how did you feel? Oh, it was absolutely incredible. Um, just to think that I can put on this incredible outfit and it's not just the clothes, it's the fact that I earned it and that I, I get to leave a legacy behind. I get to show um, my family, look, I, I, I was wearing this, you know, in front of millions and millions of people. I mean, it's just, it was just an incredible experience and to know that wow, I was a part of this huge team. And at the athletics uh, team f that went for Canada, we had our best um, medal count oh in wow. like since 1932. So knowing I was a part of that team, it feels even more special because we had such a powerful impact. So it, it's incredible. I still kind of have those moments. I'm like, wait, wait am I an Olympian? Because I'm already back at school. OK, <laughs> um, this is this is kind of weird. But I'm just using that. And I get to now have a bigger platform and get to tell people how, you know what, even though I started track later, you can't really limit yourself. You have to just keep going for those bigger goals. I know you said it's great to represent Canada, but what's it like to represent oh University of Maryland? I, I love I love being a Terp so much. Um, representing the University of Maryland is absolutely incredible. I mean, going from internationals to outdoor nationals last year was in just amazing. I was running the 400 meters. It's the longest sprint. It's just um, such an incredible feeling because I'm running as the best, but I am also one of the best. So showing those Maryland colors and showing that, yeah, we are we're a huge competitor in the Big Ten um, conference. So I think being a Terp means that, like, anything as possible. Thanks, Danielle. Misha was not the only Terp down in Rio, actually. Katie O'Donnell Bam and Jill Whitner, Maryland grads, represented the U.S. national field hockey team. Have to imagine head coach Missy Maharg is happy to see her players on the national stage. This year, she'll try to get her team back to the national title. After consecutive early NCAA tournament exits the past two years, Maharg keeping her team focused on this season. Well, we're built around the present, and we're very process-driven, and we're very eager to accept the fact that college coaching is about rotations of players and staff. We've uh, recently brought in uh, Stephanie Fee from Virginia Beach, who just competed in Rio as part of the defensive unit and able to have Velma lose back. And, you know, I just like to stay focused on what we can do and what we can't. About three years ago, the Maryland volleyball team hired Steve Ayard as their new head coach. A struggling program at the time, a move to the Big Ten, Ayard saw an opportunity. Last year, the Terps stole a set from powerhouse Penn State. They picked up a win over another ranked team in Ohio State. With a lot of young talent coming in this year, Ayard's plan appears to be progressing well. This is my first full recruiting class at Maryland. We have uh, six young ladies that are in as freshmen. 16th ranked uh, class in the country. Uh, I'll start with the good news. The good news is when we got here two years ago, we were 184th in the country, and preseason they have us at 39th. Well, this new look Maryland volleyball team will head off to a few early season tournaments before starting off Big Ten play in Minnesota on September 23rd. Well, hey, Coach, not sure why you're pointing at me, but anyway, it's been nearly a decade since Maryland men's soccer has won a national title. They've won their last four conference titles, but the Terps, well, they want more. Most of their starters have returned. They've got a veteran back line leading the way, but no more Subasa Endo, no more Mael Corbos in the midfield, and that's something coach has to worry about. But either way, Swarovski does not seem too worried. Luxury of having what I call four starting forwards right now, and that's even taking Eric out of that equation, putting him in the midfield. But Sebastian Allen, Gordon Wild have been, you know, very good in their understanding is getting better, but DJ Reeves and George Campbell have been been terrific. 
Well, the football team isn't the only Maryland squad with a new head coach this year. With the departure of Jonathan Morgan, Ray Leone is taking over the reins. After a nine-year stint with Harvard, he will have the job of leading the Terps into this season. With such a new group, there could be some growing pains. Coming along together, you know, it's, it's obviously 13, 14 new players all at one time. It doesn't happen overnight to, to be cohesive, so you have to really work at it. Well, let's talk some soccer. We are happy to be joined today by Emily Olson, a WMEC Sports Insider and a left bencher as well, and Scott Gelman, women's soccer reporter for the Diamondbacks. Let's jump right into it. You know, it seems like both of these teams have a ton of transfers, women's soccer especially. We'll get into that in a second. Now, you look at the men's soccer team, two big transfers for them. Emily, can you tell us something about that? So what's happening at Maryland is that they have a very strong returning senior back line headlined by uh, Alex Cronali and Chris Adoyatsum. And you've also got Suli Denka back there in the back line holding it down. But the big news this, this offseason is that Gordon Wilde and Jake Rosansky are the huge names coming into Maryland trying to interject some scoring energy to replace the two midfielders that left last year in Mael Corboz and Subasa Endo who were both big name uh, seniors last year. So Gordon Wilde comes from USC Upstate which is still Division One, but last year they came in at 177 while Maryland broke the top 10 the entire time. So he's coming in with a nation leading scoring title under his belt. He had 16 goals last year and uh, Coach Sasso Shirovsky is hoping to bring that to this Maryland team. Now Scott, 14 new players for this women's soccer team this year. That's got to be something hard to adjust to. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's so interesting that uh, the first time I spoke to Coach Ray Leone, he said they played name games the first week of practice. Uh, that's just how new that this unit is. You have some transfers. Uh, you have also about six freshmen, not a ton ready to contribute here, but you also have to look at what he's done early this season. So at this point, 2-1-1 uh, one and one going into some games this weekend, and it's not taken him as long as expected to put things together. I mean, you've got uh, it's different faces in goal. You've got Stephanie Sen and Caitlin Jensen, a pair of those transfers. It's really a situation where things are coming together sooner rather than later. Uh, obviously not in Big Ten play yet, but you've got a core of girls, uh, not even a complete roster that Coach Ray Leone's filled out. Uh, and they perform well to this point. I mean, you've seen different situations in goal. Uh, they haven't had a ton of success offensively, but uh, it's, it's coming together and it's probably coming together better than you would think it would uh, for a first year coach, especially here early in 2016. All right, let's get some predictions. Scott, what do we see from women's soccer this year? The key here is they want that underdog role. They said it to me week one of that preseason. No one thinks that they're going to have a lot of success, and they're using that for motivation. 2-1-1 uh, one and one early in the season. They beat a William & Mary team uh, that only lost one game at home last season. They already lost their first one there, their home opener. I think it's a team that at its best wins the majority of its Big Ten games. They have reigning national champions. Uh, Penn State at home over at Ludwig. That'll be exciting. I think a more reasonable expectation, though, is 50% uh, of their Big Ten games split it right down the middle. If, if they get to the Big Ten tournament, that's uh, definitely a, a positive sign there. And then, Emily, how's Coach Shirovsky's team going to do this year? Well, in the fall media day, Sasha Sarovsky said they're not afraid to talk about wanting a national championship. Uh, transfer Jake Rosansky, he's had a taste of the national championship at UVA himself, and he's ready to do it again. I think this Maryland team could go to the final. I don't know when, I don't know if they have enough chemistry to win, but definitely look out for their name in that College Cup final. Well, we know people in College Park certainly love their soccer. Emily Scott, thank you so much for coming on today. Well, that's our fall sports preview show. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to stay tuned for more Left Bench coverage as the season goes on. Follow us on all social media outlets at The Left Bench. Stay tuned for our coverage on theleftbench.com and keep an eye out for more TLB TV content. For all of our crew, I'm Alex Flum. Enjoy the fall sports season.